I'm just checking that our Facebook live stream is correct and then we'll get started. Thank you to everyone who has joined us. Okay, we're live streaming, so I'll start the recording button locally as well, and we'll get going. Hello, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you are, and welcome to the webinar from Faithful America, Holy Families, Holy Migrants, featuring our panelists, America Garcia Graywall, Maggie Mitchum Salem, and our first panelist will be the Reverend Dr. Alexia Salvatierra. My name is the Reverend Nathan Imsel, and I am the Executive Director of Faithful America. As you may know, if you're here, Faithful America is the largest online community of grassroots Christians putting faith into action for love and social justice. That's you. Now, you might know us most for resisting white Christian nationalism and the religious right, but it's also important to be for things, to put our values into action for those values. So among the many important moral issues that Faithful America members work for, our immigrant and refugee rights. You've seen our petitions, we've done a few other actions. We're a member of the coalition Welcome with Dignity. And I'm proud that we can have this webinar tonight to talk about the current state of immigrants, refugees, and asylum seekers at Christmas time and beyond. My deep, deep thanks to you for joining and my deep, deep thanks to our four panelists. We'll begin with a short prayer and then uh, I'll share some introductory remarks and we'll move into our panel. But thanks again to everyone who has joined. This prayer, comes is called the Prayer for the Immigrant, and it comes from the Catholic Health Association of the United States. The Lord be with you, let us pray. Jesus of Nazareth, you destroyed the border between humanity and divinity to be with us, to be born homeless in Bethlehem, to be a refugee running for your life, to be a migrant in the land of Egypt. We ask your blessing on all migrants and refugees be with those who seek to cross borders in our own time. May they find a welcome and a place of safety. Jesus, healer of all ills, you mend the body and soul. Be with those who are sick as they seek a new life. Be with those traveling with unset bones, open sores, unmanaged pregnancies. Be with the malnourished traveler, all of them unable or afraid to seek care. We pray for the many others whose footsteps are hidden with yours. Move us into their path that we may care for them as you would have us do, knowing that it is you we care for as we care for your migrant mother, father, brother, and sister. Amen. So again, my name is the Reverend Nathan Emsel. I'm the Executive Director of Faithful America and this is the webinar, Holy Families, Holy Migrants. Christmas is a time when we remember that holy the Holy Family were migrants to Bethlehem, jo Joseph and Mary. And after Jesus' birth, all three were refugees to Egypt, uh, fleeing a well-founded fear of political persecution from King Herod. And yet we didn't call this webinar Holy Family, Holy Migrants. It's Holy Families, holy migrants, plural. Jesus came at Christmas as the incarnation, God taking human form, Emmanuel, meaning God with us. But God didn't come in human form as a king or a warrior. God came as a baby born among animals to a working class Middle Eastern Jewish family in Roman occupied territory. This incarnation is one that centered the poor and the oppressed, reminding us that everyone, everyone, everyone bears God's image. All families are holy families. Everyone who has been ripped off by a coyote, lost a loved one, or themselves drowned, starved, or died of thirst or heat exhaustion trying to cross the southern border, holy. Everyone fleeing as refugees from gangs, war, or political persecution, from Ukraine to Venezuela to Southern Sudan to Myanmar. Holy. All immigrant mothers, fathers, and children separated by the Trump administration from one another. Holy. 
all asylum seekers who would be turned away now by system changes being considered by Joe Biden and Mike Johnson. Holy. The image of God is in all of them. Holy families, holy migrants. And unfortunately today, these immigrants, refugees, and asylum seekers all coming to the United States face a great many headwinds. I mentioned just now the asylum negotiations going on in Congress, linking funding for Ukraine to destructive changes in our asylum policies. These negotiations are stalled, but they'll be taken up again in January, and immigration activists are very concerned. In Texas, my home state, Governor Greg Abbott a year ago started treating migrants as political pawns, sending them all across the country, including to the vice president's house on Christmas Eve. Now, I used to live in Washington, D.C. The vice president's house is nowhere near a transit hub or any sort of services for immigrants. That was intentionally a political stunt using people as pawns on one of the coldest nights of the years. And now Greg Abbott's at it again. Texas just passed the law to round up migrants unconstitutionally as a state instead of the feds. Migrants, show us your papers. There's a recent surge in both formal holy refugee arrivals and holy immigrant border crossings. All people in need of our help, the system being overwhelmed and treating them without dignity. And once again, Donald Trump is channeling Adolf Hitler, quoting him to say that immigrants poison our blood. And yet, against all of this, let me give you two reasons for hope. First, while unfortunately Joe Biden is not a leader on immigration, unlike Trump, he can at least be led. Second, it's often faith leaders and organizers who do that leading on immigration. We saw both these pieces a year or two ago when the Biden administration said they would keep Donald Trump's low caps on the number of refugees allowed into the US. But then they reversed course. They were led, they listened. And who was it that pressured them? Immigration activists and advocates and organizers, including many, many people of faith, faith leaders and faith organizers. Working with Joe Biden, pushing him, I wish we didn't have to push, but successfully pushing him. So there is hope. And who is it? that is doing the refugee resettling. At least seven of the 10 national refugee resettlement agencies are faith-motivated organizations. The Lutheran Immigrant and Refugee Services, the United States Catholic Confer Conference of Catholic Bishops, HIAS, the Jewish organization. So we turn now to a panel featuring three leaders on these issues, a theologian and faith-rooted organizer, the incoming director of a refugee resettlement agency, that is affiliated with Church World Service and formerly Episcopal Migration Ministries, and the organizer of a memorial border vigil that partners with churches. I will introduce each speaker, each individual speaker as they share their remarks. But as I share my deep, deep thanks with each panelist for taking the time to join us already, I know we can't see you on camera, but would you please welcome America Garcia Graywall, Maggie Mitchell Salem, and our first panelist, the Reverend Dr. Alexia Salvatierra. So it's my pleasure now to turn it over to Dr. Salvatierra. The Reverend, I should read your introduction, sorry, the full introduction. The Reverend Dr. Alexia Salvatierra is the Academic Dean of the Centro Latino and the Associate Professor of Mission and Global Transformation at Fuller Theological Seminary. She is the co-author of Faith-Rooted Organizing, Mobilizing the Church in Service to the World. The only downside to a Zoom webinar is I can't get her to sign my copy. She's also the co-author of Buried Seeds, Learning from the Vibrant Resiliency of Marginalized Christian Communities, and God's Resistance, Mobilizing the Church to Defend Immigrants. I will put links to all three books in the chat in, in a minute, as well as a link to the prayer I read a few minutes ago. Dr. Sabatiera has been involved in struggles for immigrant justice for over 40 years and has been a national leader in engaging faith communities in immigration issues since 2006. Thank you so much for joining us. Good morning, Nathan. Um, I'm going to try to share my screen. Hopefully this will work. Um, you know, we're never sure with technology, but we'll see. Looks good to me. All right, here we go. So thank you all for the invitation to be here. Um, the title of my brief presentation is God and Migration Responding to the Call which takes seriously that God has a call for us in this moment, in this situation. And I think that that call begins with seeing through God's eyes. So 
you know, Nathan referred to the flight of the Holy Family to Egypt. And when uh, the, that family ran as refugees, I'm sure that people didn't see the halos around their heads. You know, this beautiful picture that you can see here with the halos. Instead, they saw them much more like the picture above that. They saw them just as a regular migrant family. You had to see them through God's eyes to see the halos. And I'm sure that when Jesus said in Matthew 25, when I was a stranger, you welcomed me, that he was remembering those early experiences of maybe being seen by some people and not being seen by others. So I would pretty much bet that everybody on this call sees migrants with those halos, more or less. Um, but what we want to do in this brief time together is to deepen that vision uh, through rooting ourselves in the word. And then to perhaps, um, through that process, increase our capacity to share that vision with others who don't see in that way. So let's jump into it together. Usually when people talk about the biblical support for immigrant justice, they talk about specific verses. And there are 92 verses on welcoming the stranger, so there's no lack of them. It's an important topic to God, clearly. Um, one of the most common ones is Leviticus 19.33, right? If anybody knows sort of what is the biblical verse that has to do with immigration, Jim Wallace called this God's immigration policy. Um, which it is not actually, it's not an immigration policy, but it's a good foundation for an immigration policy. Um, so you can read it, I don't need to read it out loud to you. But what I wanna do with you today is go deeper. Um, I'm not a big fan of proof texting. It's too subject to um, superficial battles. What I'd like to do is go deeper and talk about the themes that are core to our Christian faith. And then the relevance of those themes for the call to respond to immigrants. So Henry Nouwen, the great Catholic author, mystical author, talked about the Christian life as the journey from hostility to hospitality. Our journey from hostility to hospitality is rooted, I believe, as a Lutheran pastor, is rooted in a response to God's hospitality to us, God's unmerited favor. Um, I, When I think about Jesus's hospitality to us, I think about this verse from the Gospel of John, where Jesus says that even, even in the world outside our world that we are all going to, that we are invited into God's home and there is room for us all. So I think that, that awareness of God's embracing hospitality to us, wherever we are, is really foundational for being hospitable to others. Um, and when I talked about unmerited favor, some of you have may, heard it, have, may have heard it as a code word, code phrase for grace, which it is in my tradition. Uh, my, and Robert Chaudermero, who you can see in the picture, has done some really amazing work. He's a professor at UCLA in the Chicano Studies Department and the New Religion Department, but he's also a pastor and an immigration attorney. And he has a whole set of essays on migration as grace. And he looks at that in two different ways. And one way is, of course, the grace that migrants experience, that I have here the passage about the flight to Egypt. And just imagining how it felt like grace to be welcomed in a foreign country, something that they could have could not have been sure would happen, um, that they could have been mistreated or, or thrown out or not allowed to enter. And so I'm sure that migration for the Holy Family felt like grace. But part of what Dr. Chaudhormero points out is that it's not only the migrants that experience grace in the process of migration. This is one of my all-time favorite verses in Hebrews 13 too, do not forget to show hospitality to strangers for by doing so some people have shown hospitality to angels without knowing it. I think we only understand that scripture if we know that the word angel in Koine Greek does not only refer to celestial beings with wings, it refers to any messenger of God sent to bring a blessing. So what this verse is saying is that any migrant may be a messenger of God 
sent to us to bring a blessing, to bring a message, to bring a blessing. Um, we don't want to miss the blessing. It is grace to receive that blessing. So I think it shifts our perspective profoundly to uh, see migration as grace from both angles. But of course, if we're going to talk about grace, we need to talk about grace as a relational principle, which is a core biblical tenet. Now that doesn't mean that grace is the only relational principle. Justice is also a principle and sometimes they are in tension. But I do wanna think about grace as a relational principle together and how that impacts our response to our view of migrants, our response to migrants. So this scripture from Matthew 18 talks about the servant who um, is pardoned by the master that he has offended and then goes out, his debt is pardoned. He didn't offend, excuse me, he didn't pay his debt. And so, but he is pardoned by the master from uh, not having paid his debt, but then he goes out and he doesn't pardon his fellow servants for the debts that they owe him. And the master is not pleased. I think that grace as a relational principle on an individual basis is this call that if we have received forgiveness from God, that how then can we be so harsh in applying the law against other people? That we have to treat other people with the same grace that we have been treated. Um, and I love this simple story because it's so simple. It's hard to read it and not be convicted. But that grace as a relational principle is not only true biblically in terms of individual relationship, it's also true in society. The scripture that you see here is one of the scriptures about um, from the book of Numbers about the cities of refuge. When in ancient Israel, a person killed somebody by accident, they automatically received the same punishment as somebody who killed someone on purpose, which was a life for a life. What this scripture instructs the people to do is to protect the person who may have killed someone by accident until they can get a fair hearing, which may last till the end of their lives. It may last a long time. Um, there's no time limit to it, but they are to be kept safe in a city of refuge until that fair hearing is available to them. This concept of the cities of refuge has been at the core of the sanctuary movements that I've been involved with since 1980. But it's also been at the core of some of the response to the runaway slaves during slavery in the United States, some of the response to Jews fleeing Nazi Germany, that it's been used over and over again by the church over the ages to understand what grace looks like in society as a relational principle. But migration is not only grace, migration is communion. So this is Matthew 25, right? This is, I, I pulled out that one statement of Jesus, but of course it's helpful to go back and read the whole story that he tells about the sheep and the goats. And in that story, he says that whatever we do, for someone in need that we do for him. I always think of um, Mother Teresa. There was a British journalist who was an atheist named Malcolm Muggeridge. And he figured that Mother Teresa had to be a fraud because nobody could do what, what she was claimed as having done and be and continuing to do. You know, he thought no one could do that as a human being, just take people who were dying off the street and be with them until they died. And so he went to expose her. And of course, she was the real deal, and he spent time with her, and he did end up becoming a Christian in the process. But he describes an interaction with her in the little book, Something Beautiful for God, where he says to her, how can you do this? How can you day in and day out um, take people who are dying off the street and be with them till they die? It's awful. You must be horribly depressed. And she said, you know, if it was social work, I couldn't do it. I would, I would run out of the capacity to do it very quickly. She said, but in each person who's dying, when I look into their eyes, I see the eyes of my Lord on the cross. And it is an opportunity to give back to him what he has given to me. That's migration as communion. 
that how do we meet Jesus more deeply in the act of responding to migrants? And of course, if we see migrants through God's eyes, part of what we see is our common connection. So Genesis 1 talks about, is this wonderful story about how we all come from the same original parents um, and that we are all made in the image of God as Nathan referred to. You know, saying that we're all the fa same family is very heavy for someone of my cultural tradition. <laughs> you know, I have a sister that I don't like very much. Um, I can say that directly because she would say the same thing, but she would never be on the street if she needed me because she's family. And we know as people in the Latino community that if your family is not well, you are not well. So to take seriously that every human being is family is very heavy. Um, it means that you have to see the person at the border as your brother or your sister, as somebody who has a claim on you that goes very deep. But um, the, of course, when we talk about someone who is a Christian at the border, it goes even deeper. That's not just a member of your family, that's your arm. Um, I broke my ankle badly last April and I really understood the body of Christ because it didn't matter how well the rest of my body was. I was in terrible pain because my ankle was broken and I had to do something about it before I could be well and whole. So what does it mean to see the people at the border as to see all immigrants, not just the people at the border, as part of if they are believers, as part of our body, as someone that if they are not well, we are not well. So this is very heavy. The only way I think that we can actually take this in and live with it is to remember that the body is also responsible for responding. So it's not you as an individual that has to carry everybody in the world. It is you as part of the body that is part of this beautiful response of love. Um, so the last thing I wanna to say to you is that obviously when we see through God's eyes, then we need to respond with his heart. But that response needs to be wider than just compassion. I do love the word compassion. It doesn't mean pity. It is an English word or Spanish word consisting of two Latin words, com and pasio. And pasio means suffer and com means with. So it is looking at someone else and feeling their pain as if it was your pain and feeling their hopes and dreams as if they were your hopes and dreams. So it's a beautiful response to be compassionate, but it's not the only response that's required of us. We do need to get involved in advocacy for immigrant justice. Um, and I, the scripture that I, I'm bringing to you around this is a scripture about um, the talents, the parable of the talents, right? That we use for stewardship in churches all the time. But, you know, when man receives 10 talents, when his boss goes away, he gives him 10 talents to work with one person receives five talents, one person receives one talent, the person who receives 10 talents uses them all to produce more talents. The person with five talents also uses what that person has to produce more talents. And the person with one talent hides it in the ground out of distrust for his boss. And the boss is pleased by those who have used all their talents. When we live in a democratic society, we have the gifts of democracy. And if we don't use them for, in, as part of our response to immigrants, we are essentially bearing our talent, um, just like the person who did with whom the master was not pleased. So I just wanted to lift that up. And the very last thing I wanna to say to you, I don't have a slide for, but at Center Latino, we have what's called diplomados or professional certificates. They're six month online programs. And we have two of them on migration. Um, one of them that is focused on the United States and one of them that is focused on migration within Latin America. The one in the United States will be starting up again our next cohort in March. If you're interested, go to our website. We have it in English or in Spanish, although actually almost all of the professors who are teaching you are either immigrants themselves or um, family of immigrants. So it's a slightly different way to receive this learning than is typical. Um, I promise you that it's worth your time if you want a deeper dive. Because we have one month in that program on scripture that is a deeper dive than what I've given you right now, scripture and theology. We have another month on pastor responses, therapeutic trauma responses. We have another month on legal advocacy. Uh, it's, it's very rich. So let, just letting you know if you're interested. Thank you.
thank you and thank you for giving folks something tangible to take away uh, all of that was wonderful as an episcopal priest i who will be celebrating a mass of communion this sunday i love thinking about uh, all of this as communion uh, i just mentioned in the chat i should have said earlier we will have time for questions and answers with all three panelists so uh, at any time you can submit your question using zoom's q a feature down below the videos uh, in in writing and i'll read through them and, and we'll moderate and, and share questions uh, panelists can also see all the questions as, as they come in uh, so we can do that at the end our next speaker is uh, Maggie Mitchell-Salem, based in Connecticut. Integrated Refugee and Immigrant Services, or IRIS, is one of the nation's leading refugee resettlement agencies, helping refugees and other displaced people establish new lives, strengthen hope, and contribute to the vitality of their new communities. IRIS offers such services to refugees and immigrants as housing, employment, health, legal education, and case management. While IRIS does primarily serve Connecticut, there is likely an immigrant services and or refugee resettlement agency near you that does similar work you can support and help. So this will be a great chance to just learn about that space. Full personal disclosure, my wife works for IRIS, but I get nothing by inviting her incoming boss to this webinar. As the organization's incoming executive director, Maggie joins IRIS from, wait for it, Carthage in Tunisia where she has been Senior Resident Director for the National Democratic Institute, the NDI, since November 2020, leading a team dedicated to improving inclusive representative governance that addresses citizens' priorities. She spent most of 2020 supporting refugee resettlement organizations, including Lutheran Immigrant and Refugee Services, LIRS, in Baltimore, Maryland, and Fuji's Family, I hope I pronounced that right, in Columbus, Ohio. From 2009 to 2019, Maggie was the founding executive director of Qatar Foundation International, QFI, focused on providing K-12 public students and teachers with access to quality Arabic language instruction and cultural resources, including exchange trips. Maggie, thank you so much for taking the time to join us. Thank you, Reverend Nathan. And I'm wondering if you don't mind putting up on the screen that one slide that we have that offers more information about actually a national program yes. that Iris is part of. That would be great. Thank Perfect. you. Perfect. Shame on me that I, it's the one link I didn't put in my notes, but I'm pulling up Jen's email to get that link now. I'll have it up in just a second. Here. Great. Hi. I have dogs and a family moving about. So please forgive the background noise. A um, lot of excitement here in Tunisia in the evening. Um, I'm actually going to talk and walk, which is gonna make this even more exciting. So, hi. One of the reasons that I'm really excited to join all of you from Tunisia is because Tunisia is literally a transit point for millions of would-be migrants and also Tunisian citizens who are trying to leave Tunisia and go to Europe, mainly. Some of them will come to the United States, a very small fraction. And when I say that it is a transit point, um, we're talking from the conflict in Sudan, people making their way, if you take a look at Africa, it is quite impressive and dangerous, the journey that Sudanese are now making to get across to Tunisia and then going from Tunisia on the Mediterranean where thousands every year perish in order to find safety and security in Europe. Globally, 110 million people were on the move, according to UNHCR in 2023. 110 million. These are record numbers. At the southern border, other record numbers, 2.4 million people, many of them from Venezuela, which is among the top five countries in that 110 million um, figure of refugees. 
you have people who are fleeing some of the most brutal gang warfare, conflict, ethnic violence, gender-based violence, and are seeking the kind of safety and security for themselves and their families that is completely unavailable at home. And so from that global context to every national and state-based organization, IRIS, where we are trying to serve, and let me just go back for a moment to that 110 million. Out of that 110 million refugees, how many do you think come to the United States in a year? I'll just let you think about that. And where we think we're a very generous country in terms of refugee admittance. 110 million, we are going to take in 124,000 in the fiscal year that just started on October 1st in Washington, 124,000. San Diego apparently last year took in 230,000 migrants from the Southern border. So this number is a fraction of the overall need, the welcome that is engraved on the Statue of Liberty is not what most people feel or see or experience who are refugees and migrants. And so what really moved me about what the Reverend Dr. Alexia Salvatierra was saying is this idea of us offering welcome, of us honoring whatever faith or humanist tradition people are coming to migration with, that it is falling far short of the actual need and of our obligation. And this is certainly something that Iris feels, perhaps grounded in the fact that we started as an Episcopal refugee resettlement organization, but it infuses everything we do. This belief that we are all equal, that your status as a refugee, as a migrant, it doesn't matter what your status is. There's no one that's illegal. There are people who have documents and there are people who don't have documents. And think about what that says about a person. You have a paper, you don't have a paper. You have the right color passport. You don't have the right color passport. Um, that's all deeply, deeply challenging. And one of the things you're gonna have to excuse me for a second. This is embarrassing. Out, out. King, can you deal with them please? Thank you. I just had to call in some backup support in dealing with some dogs. I think some of you here probably are used to this. Um, so what we're... Sorry. It's going so well. Um, thank you everyone for being gracious. Uh, what we're experiencing at IRIS is a tremendous, that 124,000 number that I quoted previously is actually double what we're normally taking in at IRIS. And so we have had to hire new staff. We've had to count on our communities, not only in Connecticut, but communities across the country who are now able to sponsor refugees, the sponsor circle that you see on your screen. We're counting on a network of individuals, many of them exactly like yourself, committed, passionate, caring about others. You don't care what their documents look like. What you care about is the need that they represent. And you and we are delivering employment, legal services, to undocumented migrants. Undocumented migrants have very, very few programs, certainly 
almost no state or federal programs. Connecticut is one of the more generous states and they do offer some funding to support undocumented migrants to try to stabilize their experience in the United States. And we count on private donors and volunteers to help with schooling, to help find work. There's no one we encounter, no one that is not looking to provide for their families, to become a contributing member of their community. What they need is simple assistance. Sometimes it's an explanation of how to deal with the social security office. I don't think anyone here has any trouble imagining how difficult it can be to navigate local, state, national, healthcare, social security, Department of Motor Vehicles, when you're not used to this system. And so we have an incredible team. And again, people like you who are committed to helping. And it takes these kinds of communities across the country to actually make real what I and my colleagues see as an American commitment to the ideals that our country was founded on. And I just love the idea the Reverend Dr. Alexia mentioned about our democracy being the kind of gift, the kind of talent that we need to utilize for the benefit of others. And that if we're not doing that, we are somehow burying that. And that to me was just so powerful and real. And especially because I'm coming back into this work in a country where I and Tunisian colleagues are working to try to support democratic governance and make sure that all people feel represented and included. And I think I'll end here by saying it's so, I'm so grateful and trust me, there's, there's no uh, nepotism here. I'm so grateful the Reverend Nathan asked me to join at this time of year because it is so very true. There is nothing more powerful than Christmas to remind us of what it means to be a refugee, what it means to not have a home. And with everything that is happening in the Middle East right now and in Israel and Palestine, it's particularly compelling to remember just how fortunate in so many ways we are and how powerful these acts of kindness and mercy and grace um, how powerful that is for others. And I just, I thank you so much for letting me be part of this and apologies again for my, um, my dogs. Because I've never had a webinar or media interview be interrupted by my family's cat jumping on the keyboard. No, never. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> it happens to all of us. Um, Thank you so much. Uh, powerful words, important reminders. Very grateful for all of that. And, and hopefully we'll see you again in the Q&A. And everyone who is submitting questions, we see that there are uh, several great questions already and, and we'll take some of them uh, after our next speaker. Uh, and I am pleased to welcome America Garcia Graywell. America organizes the Eagle Pass border vigil. She grew up in Eagle Pass, Texas and has fond memories of canoeing on the Rio Grande with her father which led to her lifelong love of water and paddling. The 2023 bulldozing of the banks of the Rio Grande and the record-breaking number of people dying while trying to make it to the United States spurred her to action. Her experience living and working around the world and witnessing different immigration policies and approaches firsthand is a reminder, documented, undocumented, that all depends on what Congress says those things mean. And she has seen different policies and approaches around the world firsthand that convinced her that there is a better way to handle border safety than concertina wire and buoys. Now she works to spread the message, beginning with her local city council. And I'll add, the border vigil holds the monthly Rio Grande Memorial Vigil and Vigilia Memorial del Rio Bravo 
in remembrance of the needless loss of life along the Rio Grande. Victims are not named during the vigil, partly because the families are not always able to release the names in time, but also because many of the dead along the river cannot be identified. Their names are as lost as their dreams of a better future. America, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. So, all right. Ideally, my screen will be shared and you see the phrase, I need to say this out loud or write this down, I'm somebody. I see it, it looks correct. I'm okay. somebody. Okay, I want you to remember, I'm somebody. Okay, well, let me tell you a bit about myself. Um, my name is America Garcia Graywall. I grew up in Eagle Pass, Texas. Um, I am in a multicultural town, um, bilingual town. My family, my mother is Slovak, my father is Hispanic. Um, I was an exchange student to Germany in 1992-1993. And one of the things that you have to do, I think every student in Germany has to do, is um, you go to the museum sites of the former concentration camps. And one of the things that struck me was that these were not in the middle of nowhere. Um, in Texas, we have POW camps and such, and um, towns have grown up to them, but they're kind of in remote areas. And when I was in Germany, I'm like, wait a second, they could go home to lunch and then come back, and those are gas chambers, and those are ovens, different sites and stuff. I was just like, how, how is this possible? Um, the other thing that I found very interesting was um, things that we allowed in the United States, Germany did not allow. They just said, no, we don't do that here. Um, and they would cite, you know, we had a war about this. And as a result, you know, you cannot display these signs of this hate speech. You cannot do these different things. Um, I went away to college after that, um, and then I spent some time wandering the world. Um, I, I worked as an international student advisor um, in undergraduate, graduate admissions, and I actually ran an international student center, offered a lot of support for our international faculty as well. And um, one of the things that I found very interesting about graduate student admission is that if we said, okay, we need more fill in the blank, we could turn to international student admission and we could cherry pick we could take some of the best and brightest minds in the world in our international student admissions. Later at a private institution, we could actually bolster our revenue by bringing in international students. And, and so it was a very huge boon to us um, as university administration to be able to have international students um, as part of our, our student body population. Um, time went on and I moved to the South Pacific. Um, I spent eight years living in Fiji. Um, I established a consultancy. I worked with international business development. Uh, I also worked with micro and small business entrepreneurs. And then uh, some of my work was uh, offering visa and immigration support. Um, and I still continue to do that working remotely. Um, I've been back in the United States uh, almost entirely since 2022. My parents have had some health issues and stuff. Um, and one of the things that I brought back was the awareness that climate change is very, very real. Um, in the South Pacific, the nation of Fiji was helping countries like Kiribati plan to move the entire nation to Fiji. And they were making plans for cultural preservation and preservation of language as the entire country moved. Other countries were looking at climate refugees. And I got back here and I'm like, guys, how are we driving these vehicles, giant vehicles running on dinosaur juice? You know, we need to be transitioning to electronic vehicles. And, you know, I was looking for the solar power and I'm looking for the multi, um, multiple modes of energy generation, you know? Um, and it was, it was just very much a surprise to come back to the United States and see how in some ways we're stuck in the past. Um, and in many ways, our immigration laws are based off of World War II and the Geneva Convention, and they are not reflecting what's happening in the world. They're not reflecting what's going on with climate change and the forces that are causing the largest scale migration that our planet has ever known. So let me tell you a bit about my hometown. I was away for 30 years. Um, I came back and it more than doubled in size. We're 37,000 people. We're 150 miles southwest of San Antonio. It is a very poor county. Our per capita income is about $17,000 a year. And no, I'm not missing a zero. It is about $17,000 a year. So um, over one third of our population do not have health insurance. And uh, more than one third, we have a very uh, young population 
are receiving um, food benefits and other kinds of benefits. The county is significantly larger. We have about 68,000 people. We're also a very large county. Um, our congressman has uh, one of the largest geographic regions in the entire United States, even though our population is very low. We have two international bridges going to Mexico, going to see uh, Piedras Negras, and we have one international railroad bridge. Okay, very small, very remote. In the last year, Customs and Border Patrol says that we have had 137,000 immigrant encounters. Okay, that's just 37,000 people, 137 encounters. Now I have some quibbles with the statistics. They don't come out and say how many people were asylum seekers, how many people were economic refugees. So I've got some issues with their numbers, but still we have had a giant number of people come through my community. And just this week, we've had 9,800 people come through. Um, we have two cities, Eagle Pass and Piedras Negras. Um, the photo that I have on the left-hand side, um, you don't see Eagle Pass because we have a floodplain, uh, a delta. Um, and then the community begins um, on a bluff going up higher. Uh, but Piedras Negras, the community comes straight up to the river and they have a long, um, a linear park that runs alongside the river. And um, it's very common to see people jogging, fishing, swimming. Uh, there's several different uh, stadiums there in the amphitheater. And so you'll often hear music and all kinds of fun things happening in Piedras Negras. Up until recently, we could also do those things on the Eagle Pass side of that border. Um, I was unable to find a drone photo that shows the line of containers that is going along the river um, on the left hand side of the screen here. So, but um, the sister cities of Eagle Pass and Piedras Negras have had a wedge drawn between us. Um, and I'll tell you a bit about more about what's going on there. But first, let's talk a bit about various approaches towards immigration and towards our sister cities over the years. Um, the phrase open border is actually a relatively new phrase. It was first traced to the Obama years. Um, and essentially there was so much racism in the air that it wasn't all based on African Americans. It's like, let's pick on everybody else as well. Um, and, and that's the first time that we first started to see people talking about cracking down on, you know, an open border and things like that. Um, I'm going to back up even further. On the left hand corner, I have a photo from 1914 and these are people crossing from Mexico into the United States um, and you can see there's really not much of an inspection or anything it's just a bridge that goes back and forth and back and forth and even when I was growing up um, you could go to lunch in Mexico and go back to work it was really not a big deal at all um, we uh, the center photo is actually from our very first memorial vigil and behind Pastor Julio Leva from the Lutheran Church sorry Behind Pastor Julio Vasquez from the Lutheran Church, you can actually see the border wall um, that first went up. Um, and then behind Pastor Javier Leva, um, on the right hand corner, you can actually see the concertina wire that's at the boat ramp. You can also see the, uh, a corner of one of the containers. Um, and there's a sign that's been put up that says, No Tras Trespassing City of Eagle Pass. And when we talk about Operation Lone Star, I'll share a bit about why these things here are relevant. But um, in 2001, it was the first time that passports were required for both US citizens and anybody coming from Mexico into the United States. Now we're a very poor community, $17,000 um, average income and passports are $100 a piece. Um, so just the implementation, just the requirement of the passports made it harder for our community to go back and forth. Um, the other things that we've seen in recently, um, the 2017 child separation policy, one of the uh, camps that our children was placed in was in um, Carrizo Springs, which is just a short 40 miles away from us. Um, we've also had the border wall attempted expansion um, during the Trump years, and we had a pretty good resistance to that. Um, we've also seen the remain in Mexico protocols expedited removal, our refugee caps were dropped, and um, during the Trump years, active duty um, troops and National Guard were deployed to the border. So, so there have been a number of things, a number of approaches over the years here. Um, and then meanwhile, we have pressure growing in South and Central America and in other parts of the world as climate change and um, other factors have, have increased the need for people to move and to, to leave their homes. Um, 
Operation Lone Star is what we're currently going through right now. Um, it uh, officially began March 6, 2021, when um, the governor of the state of Texas signed eight bills into law. It's currently expended $10.5 billion, this is with a B, $10.5 billion of Texas taxpayer dollars, but also of 14 other states. Um, these other states support Operation Lone Star with money, personnel, and equipment. It's Arkansas, Florida, Idaho, Iowa, Nebraska, North Dakota, Ohio, Oklahoma, South Carolina, South Dakota, Tennessee, Virginia, West Virginia, and Wyoming. So it's it's really incredible because we're talking to people about what's going on and we'll say something like, oh, yeah, the Florida State Troopers or the North Carolina National Guard. And they'll be like, wait a second, you're in Texas right now, right? And we're like, yes. And they're like, but why is North Carolina in Texas? You know, and I me, I personally think that immigration and the border is political Viagra for conservative politicians who can't do it on their own. They can't make policy. They can't make anything happen. And so they come down here and they kick the border a little bit and their um, ratings go up and their campaign donations go up. So they are not doing effective policy. Instead, they're depending on the border. They're depending on immigration and racist rhetoric to make things happen. So 15 states are depending on this political Viagra, including my own state, state of Texas. Um, they put in 90 miles of concertina wire. They put in thousands of containers and thousands of feet of buoys. And uh, I've heard over 10,000 troops have been deployed to our border. Um, you'll see in this photo I have here in the top right hand corner that there's concertina wire there and you'll notice the concertina wire doesn't just go along the top bank, it actually runs down into the water. And so in order to claim asylum, you need to get onto um, dry soil and you need to ask federal personnel, you know, I'm here to claim asylum. That wire going down into the water is causing all kinds of injuries, which I'll actually talk about in a later slide. Going back to Operation Lone Star, in addition to their concertina mile, uh, concertina wire, um, they put up signs um, charging people with criminal trespass if they're on private property. And that sign was actually at the Eagle Pass Shelby Park, which is public property. Um, but Eagle Pass passed a um, resolution that um, if you come in anywhere other than the entrances, the land entrances to the park, that you're considered to be criminally trespassing. And, and it basically tanks any chance you have of getting asylum. Um, Operation Lone Star has also been busing and flying migrants to blue cities. And as of this Monday, December the 18th, um, the state of Texas has signed additional laws to uh, criminalize migrants. So um, it, it's really been an assault on every single aspect of, of life um, here on the border. There is a human cost to this as well. And um, in this top corner here, this is actually my photo. You may have seen it on NPR. You may have seen it on some of the different um, news um, uh, agencies and such. But um, we uh, went for a canoe and kayak trip on August the 1st, and we saw this family um, in the river. The boy had been on the shoulders of one of the younger men in the Venezuelan group. Um, and as soon as our kayak group got to dry land, um, the National Guard been uh, sitting in the back closed the concertina wire and then he would not let the rest of the family come onto land and the father was so distraught you can't really see it but the mother is actually crying you know in the background and and national guard just wouldn't let them come back on um at the time i wasn't aware of all of the different rights that, that people had um and so i i'm sitting there filming um and as as were several others um because we were there because we were watching because we're saying this isn't right um, we were actually able to contact one of our party who'd left earlier, who came down and said, you can't separate the family. And so the National Guardsmen actually um, pulled the wire back and the family was um, reunited. But um, this family was exhausted. They had been on the water since almost dawn. Uh, in the photo, it's about 1 p.m. You can just see how drawn their faces are. The temperature was about 118 degrees Fahrenheit that day. And um, this boy going back into his father's arms might have been the kiss of death because families are just so exhausted. Um, they cannot walk continuously along the top of the riverbank. The concertina wire going down into the water means that they'll walk along 
and go back into the water. They'll walk along, go back into the water. Um, as um, the wire has been cut and replaced, there's now a lot more concertina wire, razor wire. These are razor blades on the wire. Um, and you'll see people with cut hands, cut arms, sometimes cut faces. Um, you also have a lot of foot and leg injuries. We have heat stroke. We have a huge number of drownings. It's, it's really horrible. The cruelty is the point. I, I mean, it, it's, it's just so awful. Um, Families continue to be separated. Um, the policy might not be that families are separated, but often uh, when somebody is sided with criminal trespass, um, the male leader in the family, the head of the household, is given criminal tr criminal trespass, and then the children will go with the mother, and they are separated um, because their courts, uh, their cases are heard independently. Very often. And um, the father finds it difficult, if not impossible, to be reunited with his family. So what we're seeing is criminalization of the most vulnerable. And also, I'm going to call it legal extortion of those with the least, because they then have to fight unnecessary criminal charges in court. And it, it takes up so much money and so much effort. Um, there, there's also um, taxi rides across town. Um, people are charged individually at just extortionary rates, um, and it, it's really horrible. Um, I, I would really like to see um, a Department of Justice investigation onto who is making money off of Operation Lone Star and how they're making money, because this money, this $10.5 billion, is not staying in Eagle Pass. One of the things that's really frustrating is when um, you have all of these personnel who are here with daily per diems, and they're living it up on restaurants front row. Meanwhile, our community is checking out with um, electronic benefit cards and making every penny count. And they walk out in the parking lot and across the parking lot, you can see all the restaurants. And it's just line after line after line of law enforcement vehicles there. Um, it's not easy for them um, being away from their family as well. We also see a significantly higher suicide rate among law enforcement and National Guard here. And um, anecdotally, I'm hearing that there are higher rates of alcoholism and domestic violence in our law enforcement families. So this is not something that's good for anybody at all. Uh, this is hard in our community. I have a photo here of downtown Eagle Pass and you will see that it is empty. Um, the sheer number of people who are crossing right now has meant that federal personnel have been taken off of our um, They've been taken off of the bridges. Um, the railroad bridge is currently closed. Um, the um, I'm going to open up chat right here. So there we go. Um, the uh, railroad bridge is currently closed, uh, which is going to affect a, a bunch of manufacturers. It will affect um, the groceries that you have in your stores, but also um, Bridge one is closed to everybody except for pedestrians and bridge two is down to a single lane. So much of the tax revenue, sorry, much of the revenue the city of Eagle Pass has does not come from taxes. It comes from those bridge tolls. So we don't have people coming into the United States because our uh, wait times right now are over 12 hours. Um, and, and we simply just don't have people going back and forth paying $5 every time they cross the bridge. Um, Eagle Pass has a higher cost of living than Laredo or even the larger city of San Antonio. And one of the reasons is because there are no Airbnbs. We have cash investors coming up and snatching up every three bedroom, two bath house um, and smaller and larger so they can rent them out for Airbnb for all of the law, all law enforcement personnel who are staying here in the area, um, which also creates a whole bunch of other issues um, in terms of like vehicles on the street and, and so on. Um, we hear a lot about like, well, my family came to this country the right way. Um, and, and so we have families that are mixed status. Um, we have families who have, for example, a grandmother or, um, you know, some member of their family who may be a U.S. citizen now, may be a resident now, but people don't want to speak about it because it's like, oh, you broke the law. Again, the law is made by man. It's something that if we had um, uh, the political will for it, we could change this. We could make the right way, the way we're doing it right now, if we had the political will in, you know, 24 hours. Um, the pastors we work with here talk about the loss of religious freedom. Um, they cannot practice their faith. They're not able to minister to the body and soul because there are 
real world consequences to some of the things that they've been doing. The laws that were signed into law um, on Monday of this week um, are actually making them go back and focus on what is it we do? How can we continue? you to reach everybody um and we do have some people who've said you know what i'm going to keep doing what i've been doing and you know i'll face the consequences when they come um we also have a divided community um one of the things that just surprised me to no end was hearing that um border patrol um choose not to mix with latinos in eagle pass we're 98 percent hispanic because they don't know what your status is and they want to protect their safety um, and not, you know, connect on Facebook. But also this means that they don't go to church. It also means that they don't socialize with the rest of the community. So we kind of have, you know, I don't want to say us and them because it's all us, but people are holding themselves apart right there. Um, and and so it's it's really stressful. It's, it's something that um, it, it hurts to see, it hurts to live with here. So um, we started the border vigil um, when the first buoy bodies were found um, in the buoy barrier. Um, and um, we thought it would be a one-time thing. And the very, the very next day, there was the body of a six-year-old child found at Shelby Park. And, um, you know, we've had, we've had, I'm sorry, it just, there are so many deaths. There, there are just, it, there are so many deaths that are happening here and they don't have to happen. Um, the Board of Vigil is held monthly on the Shelby Park boat ramp. Um, as we've held the vigils, um, we've learned that um, in 2022, there were 853 deaths on our border. We are the deadliest land crossing in the world. Um, that number, that 853 from 2022, the 700 from 2023, that is an undercount. The forensic experts, the immigration experts are telling us that number is twice to possibly three times that height. Um, in addition, we've got high speed vehicle chases taking place here, um, leading to all kinds of injuries and deaths. And that's not something that your insurance covers because it happened in the course of a crime or something. So. Um, we installed this cross memorial at Shelby Park and it's in place through January 13th of this year. And if you have any chance to come down to Eagle Pass, Eagle Pass, please let me know because I, I very much wanna show you around. Um, but currently today, what's going on? Since Monday, we've had 10,000 people come into um, Eagle Pass. Most of them are Venezuelan. Um, this photo is where the majority of people are coming through. My photo right here is from September. There are now containers where this paved road is. But on the left-hand corner, you can see some Venezuelans who've come up. Um, they were forced to wait about four hours in the sun before they could come up. It wasn't until somebody was in medical distress that Customs and Border Patrol actually cut the wire and let them go through. You can see downriver, there's a party of people coming across the river. Uh, there's a railroad bridge directly overhead. You can see the news media. We've had so many news media here in Eagle Pass. And it's very faint, but you can see bridge number two off to the right-hand side. And there are a group of people presenting their documents to Customs and Border Patrol there in advance of their um, interviews um, actually at bridge two at the different location that's right there. So um, all Homeland Security has been redeployed to the border. Uh, we have air marshals here. We have um, Border Patrol, anybody who's in Homeland Security and who's available is here to help work with these folks. Um, the injuries are so bad, we currently have 12 hour wait times at our hospital emergency room. The railroad bridge is still closed. Uh, one of our bridges is pedestrian only. Um, our commercial bridge, the one that you can see on the right hand side is down to one lane. It's currently taking about 13 hours to leave Mexico because the lines are so long. We tend to have a surge at Christmas time because that's when most people come back to see their family. Um, but effectively, we can't, you know, go to lunch in Mexico and come back. You, you're going for a day if you go. So, um, so now I, I want you to answer the question, you know, what can I do? I want you to think to yourself, what can I do? And I'm going to urge you to educate yourself um, and others about the history and diversity of immigration and religion in the United States. Um, one of the things I hear is like, oh, well, there weren't that many Mexicans here. From researching my own parents' genealogy, I can tell you that my father and his family does not show up, even though they know where they are. They have their own records about where they were because the U.S. Census simply did not record them. 
Um, something you can do is you can support and participate in local organizations and initiatives. You heard about some great ones earlier in the session here. Um, you can advocate for immigrants and refugees. You can speak out and take action against hate and violence in your community and online. And it can be as simple as like you hear somebody and they go, ha, ha, ha. You're like, I don't get it. Explain the joke to me. I mean, it can be as simple as that. People are like, oh, wow. You know, someone says something like, yeah, we don't do that here. That's not on, that's not cool. So you can change the norms with what you say and do every single day. The other thing you can do is you can establish partnerships and show up to support your partners. Um, your partners. Um, so this young man here in the photo is um, an award-winning um, uh, member of our band. Uh, he is also in one act play. He's also an honor student and he's like, America, I wanna help, what can I do? And he showed up one afternoon to paint crosses, you know, uh, he also helps me with translating documents into Spanish. So there are so many things you can do. You don't have to do what everybody else is doing. Um, I also want to show you my earrings. Um, one of the groups that we partnered with is the Sudo Network for Solidarity, and they are descendants of the Japanese Americans, the Japanese um, and the Japanese Americans who were interned in Crystal City, which is just 40 miles away from here. Um, that was a family camp and there were children who were there. They speak up today for children in detention camps because in the 1940s during World War II, nobody spoke up for them. So yeah, somebody ought to do something. And remember at the very beginning of this, we started out and we said, I'm somebody, you can do these things here. And I invite you to connect with us. Here are our contact details, and I'm more than happy to, you know, show you around if you come down to Eagle Pass, but also we live stream our vigils every month. We invite you to join us. Thank you, America. That was wonderful is the wrong word because it's hard, but you really the humanized things, your pictures, your emotions, stories. It shows us the overwhelming everything, but makes it, it reminds us that this is about our families because that's somebody's family. People are people. Uh, thank you for all that. And I really loved your point there at the end. I'd not thought of it. Hey, I'm just joking. Explain the joke to me. I don't get it. Of course I get it, but you, you tell me. I love that. Wow, that would be so powerful. Uh, and you finished on the perfect note. People always ask, well, uh, what can I do? And we have, I think every one of our panelists today has offered us some action, something, uh, the sponsorship circle, things to say in conversation, uh, uh, the monthly vigil to watch, uh, the, the certification program at uh, Fuller. I'm gonna share a few actions too. Then we're gonna turn to Q&A. Uh, if you, uh, attendees, if you haven't, if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A box down below on Zoom. Uh, several are different variations on what can I do, but they have specific questions about specific kinds of actions. We'll go through those. I'm going to put a few things in the chat right now. Um, so first, actions, four actions you can take. First, contact, oops, I wrote defend refugees. That should say contact Congress to defend asylum seekers. That's And that's an important legal distinction. But right now, Congress is considering, President Biden, a Democratic lawmaker, is considering gutting our asylum system, just completely changing and overhauling our asylum laws in ways that would make it really hard for people to seek asylum from violence and gangs and war in the United States. Uh, why to secure funding to fight Vladimir Putin and Speaker Johnson and, and even Mitch McConnell, who used to feel differently about the war in Ukraine, they are demanding they will only keep the government open, they'll only fund uh, fights against Putin if we hurt immigrants and asylum seekers instead. Somebody's got to hurt. If, if we can't let the Ukrainians hurt, let's make sure the folks at the board hurt. Someone's got to do the suffering, seems to be the line. And unfortunately, Democrats seem to be going along with it. Uh, negotiations will pick up again in January. Please, please, please contact Congress as well as the White House to demand that they leave the asylum system and asylum protections in place as they are now. They should be strengthened, not weakened. So there's a link to an action you can take with Faithful America to send your senators a letter. We may have something for President Biden in the, uh, the early January. And if you sign uh, this, this action at the Senate, we'll also send you ways to call the Senate in early January as well. The second thing you can do you might remember, it, well, it's been really seven years, in 2016, Faithful America put out these immigrants and refugees welcome banners that showed the Holy Family fleeing to Egypt. You can still find these banners on churches across the country from Atlanta to Honolulu. We don't have any more of the banners themselves. We, we still get questions seven years later, can I get a banner from you? But we do make the image files available, and I've put the link in the chat. 
you can get one of this, just take the image file, um, not to buzz market a major national corporation, but I had Staples print one of these that I take to conferences and things that came out really well. So if there's a Staples or, or that kind of a printing area in, in your area where you can order from Staples online, um, you can get one of these banners and hang it at your church and send a moral message, hopefully a moral message that is also accompanied by action. But even making that statement at a church or a place like that, a house of worship, uh, is an important statement. So you can use those images and get those banners. You'll have to pay to order the banner, but we give you the image for free. Um, third, there is probably an immigrant services or refugee resettlement agency like IRIS near you. Look them up. See what they need. Reach out. From accompanying migrants to court dates, that's when I first learned of IRIS when I moved to Connecticut, was they put out a volunteer call to have folks just drive immigrants to court, sit with them, not do anything legal, just be present and supportive. Maybe the refugee resettlement agency where you live runs a food pantry or clothing pantry and they need volunteers. Uh, maybe, like we heard, they need someone to sponsor an asylum seeker or refugee family. Look them up, find out how your church or your family or you can get involved. Lastly, I put links to several other organizations you, you should check out. The Welcome with Dignity Coalition, of which Faithful America is a member, United We Dream, Families Belong Together, possibly your denomination's policy office. I mean, most denominations do a lot of things on immigration. Faith folks lead the way. So that's, I'm going to ask my, my question to the panelists, and then we'll, we'll take another 15 minutes. We'll go to about 3.30 Eastern time uh, and go through some of the questions. But um, what, to, to the panelists, I would ask, what do you see faith groups doing? I don't, I'm not asking so that we as Christians can pat ourselves on the back, but it's examples that maybe can inspire us. Um, Maggie, I, I know that you, you're affiliated with Church World Service, used to be Episcopal Migration Ministries. America, you introduced me to a pastor in Eagle Pass via Zoom. I have not been to Eagle Pass, whose, whose church runs a shelter for folks crossing the border. You talked to us about how this impacts religious freedom. You showed pictures of pastors at the border. Uh, Reverend Alexia, I know you've worked with so many people doing amazing things. Can you tell us what do you see people of faith doing, stories that we might learn from? And why don't we have Maggie go first? Well, you know, I'm, I'm going to speak to the Tunisian context because I, I have more experience here than I have yet in Connecticut. And I just have to say that so many people here, whether they're Tunisian or European or American, wherever they're from, Christians, Muslims, Jewish peoples, there are people of all faiths here. And they have organized when there was a migration crisis in February, when the president of Tunisia um, accused black migrants of causing problems in the country, migrants from sub-Saharan Africa. Um, there were problems. They were driven out of their homes. Um, some of them were living in different um, unstable living conditions and the people that owned the buildings kicked them out onto the street with nothing. Um, they were robbed. Uh, many of them had to take up shelter, no shelter actually, outside the um, one of the large international NGO offices that takes care of migrants, the International Organization of Migration, IOM. And so they were literally out in the open. And people of all faiths came together and brought them food. They organized um, themselves into a volunteer network. This was all spontaneous in order to bring relief. There were children, small children, infants among this group. And we're talking hundreds of people who suddenly had nothing and the little that they had was robbed uh, when they were kicked out of wherever they were living and the jobs that they had. It, it's a horrible situation. The situation at the southern border, I think, resembles this in so many awful ways. And to see that network, that interfaith network come together, it was just incredibly powerful. Thank you. Let me pass it to Reverend Alexia next. It's been a, a few minutes since we heard from you. I want to say that um, we've been talking about a variety of concrete actions, but I want to say something about this Kairos moment and where we are, like what is needed right now. Um, I think most people don't know that we had two fully bipartisan immigration reform proposals. 
one in 2007 and one in 2013. Um, and when the components of those proposals were run by the average American, it got between 70 and 80% support. The DREAM Act um, has gone between 75 and 90% support consistently. So that's a little confusing, right? Like, why are these largely supported? Why do most Americans actually want a system that is effective, fair, hum and humane, right? And then why don't we have one? And um, of course, there's there's waves of reaction and fear right now that have been stimulated that are worse. But I think still the fundamental truth applies that people want that. Why don't we have it? Um, well, because you're, you know, when we looked into that, when we looked at the difference between what was happening in Congress and um, these surveys, what we realized was that your average American would love a better immigration policy, but they don't care. It's not about them. People don't call their legislator unless it's about you. The most, the vast majority of people. So the only people who were calling were the people who were terrified, who saw immigrants as a threat, and they call over and over and over again. So all the majority of people who want a better system weren't calling like the people who just want immigrants gone. Um, they didn't have the passion. And then immigrant networks don't have the hope. Immigrant networks feel like, you know, we know we're a minority. We know people don't care. Why should we get involved? Uh, what the church has the opportunity to offer when we get together across immigrant and non-immigrant lines is the exchange of passion and hope where non-immigrants get passion because they they know immigrants intimately as peers. I want to say that, not as recipients of charity, but as peers, as brothers and sisters working together in the vineyard. When you have that experience, then you get passion when you haven't had passion before. And if you are come out of an immigrant network, if you realize that there are people who have more resources um, and more access, and they're standing with you, then you feel encouraged and you feel hope. So the church has to build this relationship that increases passion and hope. That's always been true. Um, one of the reasons why we went from in 2007 when we couldn't pass the legislation at all to 2013 when we passed the Senate and we would have passed the House if we'd had, uh, if the speaker had taken it to the floor. He didn't take it to the floor for a vote because he didn't, because there were members of his party that said it's not in our political advantage to solve the problem. But but if he had taken it, we would have won. The difference between 2007 and 2013 was the faith community. So we made a huge difference before. Right now we're facing, for many reasons, waves of, of terror and a sense of being threatened by many Americans. But again, that means that we objectively don't have a lot of chance of passing legislation. We can influence President Biden to walk back some things potentially, but we can't pass legislation right now. It's not possible, but we can build base. And what do I mean by that? Um, things take a long time. <laughs> Americans are instant people, but profound change takes a long time, it takes many decades. I've been in this struggle for many decades. I know it will take many decades more. And so what do we need to do? We need to broaden the base. We need to get more and more people engaged. And churches have a unique opportunity to do that. But in order to do that, we have to overcome the societal divide. Right now, Christians are separated into right and left just as much as everybody else is. And we're separated into immigrant and non-immigrant. And what we really need to do is be very intentional about our bridge building. And that's not easy. I mean, often people that are passionate are like, I don't want to talk to those people. I want nothing to do with those people, even if they're in my family. I want nothing to do with them. <laughs> that doesn't, I mean, that's a natural reaction. It doesn't help. We have to be very intentional about building bridges, which really are not made so much with words. They are made by engagement and joint mission. So if immigrant and non-immigrant churches go together to respond to immediate need, something begins to happen that changes people's hearts and minds, that makes people open to a dialogue. So it's not just saying the right thing on Facebook. I'm sorry, it doesn't work. It's building relationship in joint mission in a way that makes people people to each other. That's the hard, slow work. It's hard work. It's slow work. 
But that kind of base building, and I'm not saying don't do the advocacy, do do the advocacy, because even pulling the Biden administration back a little from the worst of the abuses, it helps a family here, it helps a family there, it matters. You know, don't not do it. But if you really want to make a difference right now, build base. That's spoken by, they call me, around my neck is my favorite title. Some of my, my students gave it to me. It says La Madrina, the godmother, because I've been doing the work for 40 years. So that makes me the godmother. Um, so, you know, I speak as the godmother. If you're, you know, at a minimum, get your voice out there, sign on, click. But if you really want to make a difference, be committed to building base. And that does mean partnering because, yes, you don't know how to do that. It's overwhelming. But there are people that do. And so getting engaged with people probably in your denomination, there are people that do, you know, that train in this kind of bridge building and create joint mission opportunities. And, you know, so and sometimes knocking on the door of someone across the immigrant a non-immigrant line, a lot of immigrant pastors would be very surprised <laughs> if you knock on the door, but but welcoming. So, you know, some of it do get some training, do partner. You know, don't expect yourself to know how to do this, but also don't be afraid. Whatever you can do helps. Thank you. And Anna Medica, anything? What? How are faith groups working with you? What do you see faith groups doing? And you had a wonderful slide, but is there anything else you would add on, on what we can all do? Because I'm somebody. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Somebody I do something. I'm somebody. Um, well, I mean, it, it sounds trite, but think globally, act locally. What can I do right here where I am with what I've got? Um, and I'm going to tell you to organize, you know, look to your left, look to your right. Maybe it's in your church pee. Maybe it's a cafe, coffee shop. Um, you know, speaking something out loud is incredibly powerful. Um, I, I spent eight years in the South Pacific. It was very frustrating me because that was during the Trump years. And um, I remember pouring stuff out on Facebook. A friend of mine wrote to me and she said, I was in a church meeting and I was so upset. I didn't know what to say. I remembered you said something and I got what you wrote on Facebook and I read that during the meeting. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, and, and it's amazing what happens when you speak up because you make it easier for the next person to speak up. You know, it's one of the reasons, like, why do we talk about partners if we're straight? You know, why do we um, wear a rainbow flag? Why do we do these things? It's not because of me. It's because I want to show other people it's safe. Um, so, for example, one of the things I'm wearing is a butterfly pendant. And it's because, you know, butterflies, monarch butterflies cross um, the Rio Grande every year as part of their migration. And it's a symbol for migration. And, you know, it might not mean anything to the average person, but to the folks who are looking for symbols, who are trying to find out, are you safe to talk to? You can give them that symbol and say like, hey, I'm here for you. I'm a safe person. The other thing is show up. Every time it says the public is invited to 10, I'm somebody, they want me to come, even though I have no connection to this group right here. Um, minister to the body as well as the soul, because people can't hear you over the hunger in their stomach. You know, people can't, you can't share your message if they have childcare needs. So, you know, really it is necessary to minister to the body. Basically take a look at what your time, your talent and your treasure is and find out a way to use those in support of your values. You're not taking the U-Haul to heaven. Let's use them here on earth right here today. Thank you, not taking a U-Haul to heaven. Uh, there's a question in, in the comments and I think that we've touched on a lot of the questions in the comments already. Um, things that were asked in 10 minutes later were, were answered in another part of the presentation. I do want to lift up specifically what Keen Berger asked. What is the most effective way to change the national mind regarding immigration? Because we're talking about what can I do? And, and uh, certainly we organize, we want to pass legislation. How do I do that? But, you know, to pass legislation, you need lawmakers willing to pass it. How do you affect, affect elections? Well, you mobilize people, but you also change hearts and minds, uh, especially at local levels, too, with the, the laws that matter there part of the organizing, part of the getting things done is is that changing minds. And I think that all of our panelists have spoken to that a little bit at, at how, how it, it starts from the ground up and how we work with the people we know, how we complicate things, racist comments that are racist jokes, how we build relationships, build the base. I would point you to the webinar we had last month, just before Thanksgiving with Faithful America, 
uh, it was called a a tough turkey and it, when Christian nationalism shows up at your holiday table. And it was a discussion, was, we were talking with some ex evangelicals with the Episcopal Bishop of Washington and uh, uh, with the head of Sojourners, Adam Russell Taylor, on, on how to have tough political and religious conversations. But a lot of what was said, I think is really applicable to any issue, including immigration. People uh, are fearful, meet them where their fear is, figure out what, what where's the emotion that's coming from this, listen to their concerns. Uh, it's not about throwing a bunch of facts at them because what we remember from our conversations is how they made us feel. And no one's gonna go, oh, I remember these five amazing things you yelled at me. It's, or even these five amazing things you calmly shared with me. It's, you made me feel argued with. You made me feel wrong. I don't like that. I don't like you. So how do we make somebody feel in these conversations? And that's what starts to open the door to the humanizing element, to more understanding, to moving forward together uh, in, on, on any issue. The other piece, of course, is storytelling when it's humanized. I mean, we move forward on LGBTQ issues thanks to things like It Gets Better and hearing these human stories that America shared a number of examples with. But that's that's on the you know one-to-one -one level. It's so different on the national level. So I'd love to get in a couple more questions, but is there anything any of our panelists would say about changing minds, especially at the national level, that maybe uh, hasn't already come out of what you've already shared? And, and then we'll move on to another question in the next couple of minutes. Yes. I, I just want to lift up that in the book that I wrote called Faith Rated Organizing, that we have a, a strategy called Serpent Dove. And I just want to lift that up because it's a way of changing arts and minds that recognizes the different aspects of people. So just want to name it. Thank you. And um, I also want to say that the air war and the ground war are both important and very different. I'm not an air war person, so I can't talk about that. But there are air war people working on this. Thank you. Maggie, were you starting to add something? I, I was just going to say that I, I really liked that head and heart reference. And while I'm sorry, uh, <laughs> um, Alicia, I haven't read your book, but I one of the things that I wanted to talk about is um, or mention here is that the spiritual and the compassionate and, and grounding in faith is critically important. And there's also the head case, which is we need immigration, period. We need it. We need to fill jobs. We need nurses. We need critical professionals. We need unskilled labor. We need everybody because there are demographics in the United States that are certainly trending down in terms of population. And so as we decouple this from it's the other, right? That mass, that scary thing to someone here to help. You know, I, I like the, we offer help. And then also it's both ways and it's that reciprocal. And so if you aren't able to engage on the spiritual on the compassionate, to me, it's engaging on the, we need it and they're offering and we should make welcome. Thank you. Uh, let's take, I've got two more questions. We could, even if everyone, panelists, attendees, if we all wanted to stay an hour, and we could have spent an hour listening to any one of our three panelists today. They are fantastic each. Even if we could all spend another hour, we're going to make this video available. And uh, if it looks like a two-hour video instead of a 90-minute video, fewer people are going to want to click play and watch in the first place. So we're going to go ahead and wrap up, but I'd like to do two more questions first. Uh, one is very nuts and bolts. Someone, an anonymous person asked us, about the difference between an undocumented person at the southern border and someone who has gone through the legal United Nations process for refugee resettlement. But I think that this was a, a very well-intentioned question because they, they followed up. People simply crossing the border without documentation, are they refugees, asylum seekers? Are they just coming for economic reasons? Should they be encouraged to do so? So I, I will say something briefly, then I want to turn it to, to Maggie and then America and, and Dr. Sabatera can add. But uh, two things here. I mean, it's a it's a great question to ask. It's such a complicated legal issue with so many different categories and distinctions. Uh, a refugee is someone with a well-founded fear of political persecution who's gone through a very extensive United Nations vetting process and has legal status. Also, refugee is a common word we've had since before the United Nations. Uh, an asylum seeker is someone who has 
crossed the border, presented themselves to the United States government and said, I'm facing stuff like gangs or war in my home country. I can't go home. Give me asylum. It's a legal process. They're entitled to a date in court. People showing up at the border, maybe they have a visa, maybe they don't have documentation. All too often now we bring up immigration and people automatically start yelling about undocumented folks. When, when so much of this is documented legal, but in complicated different ways. And I don't care if someone is undocumented because Jesus didn't say, whoa, whoa, you want me to heal me? Heal, heal, heal you? Show me your papers first. Day to day in our lives before helping someone, we never ask, did you ever jaywalk? Did you ever shoplift? Did you ever speed? We just love one another. We just help each other. And if crossing the border happened at one point illegally, that's just one more thing in the person's background. Who cares? So what? We are all made in God's image. And the other piece to remember is the government has made it very hard to cross the border legally. You're going to tell somebody you've got to follow the law. Don't make it impossible to follow the law. Don't tell somebody, if you want my help, jump 20 feet in the air from a standing jump and then yell at them when they only jump two feet. You know, we, we've made it too hard. It takes 18 years to cross the border. You don't wait 18 years to give your children a better life. They're not children anymore. So we could talk about all these distinctions, but let's walk and talk and chew gum at the same time and help all holy families. Maggie is the person doing a lot of the, the legal work. Is there anything you would add to that? And then the, the, our other panelists as well, would you add anything to that? Just very briefly, I'd only add because you did such a great job of summing up the different distinctions that at uh, IRIS, the Sun um, legal team works on supporting as many undocumented asylum seekers as we can. They are not afforded a lawyer. And you think about the circumstances in which, um, you know, someone accused of a crime, if they don't have resources, should have legal defense. You don't go into a court without a lawyer. Thousands and thousands of undocumented asylum seekers are not given a lawyer. And the number of organizations like ours that are able to find the funding to make that happen are a tiny fraction of the actual need. Now think about doing that. Think about filling out these forms, 14% on average of those asylum seekers who attempt the process without the benefit of legal counsel, 14% receive positive outcomes. And by contrast, on the other side, it's well over 60% if you have a lawyer who's able to help you with the process. It's shocking. So I just wanted to add that one, um, one bit of programming that we work on, but that is severely underfunded and so much needed. I would just add that it's not illegal to cross the border and ask for asylum. And asylum is essentially refugee status asked for from another place, not a, not a third country refugee center, but at the border. And that is completely legal. People need to know. Well, Texas made it illegal on Monday. So Texas said that if you do not come in at an official port of entry, then you have broken the law. First time through, it's a misdemeanor. Second time through, it's a felony. So um, it's going to get challenged in court. Um, it's a staple of international law. And uh, Texas is bulldozing the Rio Grande, which is the number one, is the only source of water for much of the border. And they are not looking at what's legal or not legal, um, unless it's their laws. You can't break the laws of the state of Texas. You can break everybody else's laws. Um, but um, the whole refugee versus asylum seeker versus immigrant, it's a form of economic warfare. If you have money, you're never illegal. If you have money, you have options. If you don't, then you're trying to survive. And, and, and you know, that's your very first human right, that right to life. So, and, and we, um, distance ourselves from it and we say oh it's happening in a remote place called eagle pass that nobody's ever heard of and doesn't have any local news media or anything um but really it, it comes down to um you know people are trying to live um and we need to make it easier for us to survive we're all in this together we're all on this planet together thank you um texas greg abbott let me just note briefly that now two years in a row, so we're making it an annual tradition, Faithful America has put out a list of who we're calling 
the false prophets of Christian nationalism, both in the church and in society and politics. Uh, Greg Abbott has been on that list, is on that list. So we, we uh, are with you there. Our last question, it's both a hard one and a softball at the same time. Nonprofit hospital worker Elizabeth Granger asked us, how do you maintain hope in the face of so much suffering? How do you, how do you three maintain hope in the face of so much suffering? How do you cope with being present with suffering, moral injury, and distress? Many thanks and may God bless you. Who wants to take that one first? That's what it means to be a Christian that you know, most of us in the United States have never had to experience what most Christians around the world and throughout the ages are, which is that we carry the cross. And you know, God sustains when you do. I, I always think of what Peter said to Jesus when Jesus said, are you gonna leave? And Peter said, where would we go? You know, you have the words of life. So you don't get the words of life. You don't get the resurrection without the cross as Christians. It's not available. So those of us who, of course, we've been lucky enough to be called beyond the superficiality of much American faith through our life experiences. Um, but it's a blessing to actually be in reality where all the other Christians around the world, and they just have always been, even though it's hard. Of course, it's hard. It's the cross. It's, it's hard. Maggie, how do you maintain hope? Uh, I, I just always believe that, you know, I, I've flown a lot um, in my life. I just have had a lot of international travel, national travel. And you realize on cloudy days when you're flying that up above it's sunny, that it's always sunny that there's always hope and that humans, and maybe I'll go a little beyond the spiritual to just who we are. Humans are hope-based creatures. I fully believe that. And when you see people as I've seen, as everyone on this panel has seen who have been through the most excruciating circumstances, have lost everything, family, limbs, jobs, things that are largely unimportant, like belongings, and they move forward. They become a story that we all share as something phenomenal, but they're there every day. The people we don't know will overcome. And so I guess, yeah, humans are hope-based creatures. Oh, goodness. I am going to talk about a different story. Um, and it's May 24th, 2022. That was the day of the shooting in Uvalde, Texas, which is my parents go to church in Uvalde, Texas. Eva Mireles was my sister's classmate. They went to elementary school, junior high and high school together. She was one of the teachers at Rob Elementary. Uh, I was aborting. I got out of bed and I just I felt like I couldn't move when I got the news. And so I'm like, I have to send a card to the family. I can't just send it to one. I have to send it to both teachers. Next thing I know, I'm making a classroom set of cards. I'm in Fiji. I'm on the other side of the world. I'm across the international dateline. I felt so incredibly alone. I uh, shared what I was doing with some other folks. And I got a call saying, one of my good friends here in Fiji um, is from Parkland, Florida she would really like to sign those cards as well. And so I said, oh, wow. So I ended up going to a couple different places and having people join me to sign these cards. And we shared space together, we prayed, we told our stories and we weren't alone. I had a member of active duty military who showed up on my doorstep in the evening and he had gotten an email saying that he could not speak publicly. But one of the things they said he could do it was send a condolence card. He's talking to his wife about it. And she's like, you have to go see her. <laughs> um, and we cried together. We shared together. 
what started out as me trying to help somebody else was something that helped me. I, it still hurts like anything, but I wasn't hurting alone. It's a marathon, not a sprint. Pace yourself because <laughs> we got a lot of problems in this world we got to solve. But community care, you know, when you are hurting, find the other folks who are hurting with you. And, you know, sometimes it's the band aid. Sometimes you just stopping that bleeding right there. But you find other people who are like minded. And the next day you do something bigger. And the next day you do something bigger. And we can change the world. But first of all, we got to speak up, we got to find each other. So in answer to your question, I'm going to say community care and find ways that you can support each other in partner organizations. It'll help you, but not just that, it'll help you with your own personal care. And these burdens are so much easier to care when they're shared across many shoulders. So and I, I want to say thank you for <laughs> giving me a bigger network because I've been copying down email addresses and telephone numbers and I'm going to be talking to y'all offline. So I, I really appreciate the hope that you've given me today as part of this conversation. So thank you, Raven. Thank you, America. You've all these such a hard topic for me. I have a, I'm from Texas originally, been a long time. I have a preschooler. Uh, I'm, I'm sitting about 20, 30 minutes from Sandy Hook right now, but there was something about, there was something about the cops at Uvalde, and I can't say more than that without losing it. Um, so to, to I mean, I'm still angrier at that than I've ever been at any news story. But to hear you then connect some humanity and some community care and some hope to that story is particularly powerful for me. Thank you. I thought I was going to wrap things up, say Merry Christmas, thank our, everyone. But I do want to read one more thing from the comments, not a question, a little story we're going to end on because it, it's hopeful too. Uh, Catherine Cherry shared her story in the Q&A. And it shows us what happens when we help one another, what happens when we love our neighbors. She says, 43 years ago, I was a new single mom and I took in four Vietnamese children who had lived in a refugee camp for two years after seven tries to escape by boat. They were a Canadian government sponsored family. Their mother was dead and their father was put in the hospital as soon as he arrived because he had formerly undetected TB. My own kids were six and eight. Uh, she talks about what happens with the children, raising them, the churches that got involved, the things they did, pe what people did, bringing food, treating for head lice. Where are those four children now? The oldest is an engineer married to a doctor with one child. The second became a nurse, married an engineer and had four children. The third is a cop married to a businessman and has two children. The fourth is a chemistry and science teacher in a private school. And Catherine shares more, but Catherine, thank you for what you've done. But more than that, thank you for sharing because those stories are hope. There is hope, like in America's example of community care, when we look at how people care for one another at that personal level. And there is hope in hearing from you three. Thank you so much. America Garcia Graywall, the Reverend Dr. Alicia Salvatierra, and Maggie Mitchell Salem for taking this time as we head into Christmas. Merry Christmas to you three. Merry Christmas to everyone who watched. We will send out the link. God bless you all. Have a great night.